So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ahmaduhu wa usalli ala Rasul al-Kareem. Brother Muhammad, thank you for coming. Uh, today, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about miracle of the Quran, right? And so, um, there's one book that you've been trying to get the youth and people to study. Uh, it, why don't you tell us about that and then give us kind of like a summary. And then I think you have a lecture series, actually, that you want people to listen to. So over here, we'll do a summary, and then we'll encourage the people, inshallah, to go and to your um, YouTube channel and to listen to that series so that they can appreciate, you can say, the miracle of Qur'an. So, uh, Bismillah. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi shirah li sadri wa sili yambi wa ahlu luqtatan min lisani yatqa wa qawli. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh, and thank you very much for this honor and opportunity. Uh, yes, Shaykh, the book is called Al-Mu'ajizah by Dr. Ahmad Bassam al-Sa'i. And you are very right. I've been trying everyone I know in my family, friends, in my circle, everyone on, on Facebook to at least give the talkhis of this book a read. Uh, the book is in two volumes. The original Arabic work is in two volumes, Al-Mu'ajizah 1, Al-Mu'ajizah 2. But uh, Dr. Ahmed Bassam Asai did a talkhis, a summarization of these two volumes himself. Th that book is Talkhis Kitab Al-Mu'ajizah. It has been translated into English. It is available on Amazon. It is available elsewhere on bookstores. And anyone around the world can really... Uh, buy it. it. It's not very expensive. I think it's three or four dollars for for uh, for the Kindle edition. Why this book is important? Like we have talked, yes, Sheikh. Um, now, Bihamdi Taala, you know Arabic language. I know Arabic language. You have read Ummahatul Kutub, Bihamdi Taala. You have read the taf Tafsir. Um, the Tafsir works. Talk at length about the miraculous nature of the Quran. And really, people like uh, uh, Fakhruddin al-Razi, people like Zamakhshari, people like uh, Tabari, all of them, all those big guns, big names, they talk about aspects of the Quran that are miraculous in nature. What Dr. Ahmad Bassam Asai has done is actually <coughs> in alignment with today's age and time, which is empirical scientific data. That is what today's that is what today's academia is based on. That is what today's Western dominant uh, epistemology looks for. And so what he has done is he has done a study, a complete study of the language of the Quran, and has shown through scientific data collection, empirically verifiable scientific data collection, that the words of Allah differ from the words and usages of human beings. In this sense, this is a seminal work. This is a groundbreaking work. Now, we have all been hearing, you know, uh, when we are born into the tradition of Islam, into the culture of Islam, that Quran is a miracle. But what is a miracle, really? I mean, a miracle is when uh, Zakaria salam had Yahya salam at a very old age, and his wife was uh, Aqira was unable to conceive. That is a miracle. I see that happening around me in my family. Primary gravida are born of very old couples. So that is a mojiza. What else is a mojiza? Somebody who met with an almost fatal accident, who severed his, um, um, his back pretty badly and came to life afterwards. People say, oh, mojiza ho gaya. Mojiza. Oh, it is a miracle that this guy who severed his back completely is, is walking today. So, but what is the mojiza of the Quran? That is the real thing. We have always been hearing this. I've been hearing this since my childhood. Quran is a mojiza. But can we put a finger on it? Can we show in concrete empirical terms? Okay, this is the mojiza of the Quran. Now bring on to a surah like it. What is that miracle? This is what Dr. Ahmad Bassam Asai shows us through this venture of his. And this is why this book is so important. Now, a couple of things before going into this. First of all, you can't appreciate a language really unless 
you get to know that language. There is this huge thing in academia called lost in translation. So works in the higher register of a language can never be accurately translated into another language. Everybody knows this. This is an established fact. I mean, you take Shakespeare from my field of studies, literature, you take Shakespeare, you take Ted Hughes, you take, you know, writers, uh, big writers, big names, their works can not really be translated 100% into other languages. Bila imtithal u bila tamthil, Quran is the book par excellence written in the highest register of Arabic language. And it cannot be, cannot be, cannot be. Please, my viewers need to understand this. I have this talk time and again with many people. Oh, sir, so you, do you want to say we can't read Quran in Urdu? We can't understand it? You can, but not 100%, never 100%, unless and until you strive to learn the language itself, you won't be able to understand the Quran 100%. The way I like to put it, uh, for non-Muslims or even Muslims in that matter think of Quran as a sea now the surface level you can get even with the translation you can get the basic message Tawheed, Risala, Qiyama you'll get that Absolutely. you can't dive deep and get the corals you can't dive deep and get the jewels you can't, you can't. and the one who understands Quran uh literally falls into a trance state as soon as he starts hearing Quran. It's just natural. Yani. So anyway, so yes. So yes. So that's the first point. And Sheikh, uh, mashallah, you gave a, a very nice analogy. And just a quick point on this point of yours. I was talking to this Christian sister the other day, and she was saying the usual thing that non-Muslims say, oh, but you have the translation, so show me from translation this, or show us from translation that. And when we go to Arabic, they say, oh, but we don't understand Arabic, so are you trying to say Quran is only for the Arab-speaking world? Well, here is the thing, guys. The Jews, they go to go back to Old Testament in its original language. That is a live language in Israel. They teach their children Hebrew. Tanakh is in Hebrew. They study it in Hebrew. All right. Now, Quran is in Arabic. It is a live language. You pick up Quran from any bookstore and it would primarily be in Arabic language, not in English or Urdu or Bengali. It is a live language. It is spoken all over the world in Arab countries. We teach our children Arabic language, no matter where we belong to. Christians, you guys basically have a second-hand, uh, let's say, book. The, 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 the canon that you call Bible, some of it is translated from Hebrew, some of it is translated from Cognac Greek, some of it is translated from this, some of it is translated from that. So this is not our fault. If you read it in English and you can't understand the original language of the Old Testament or the New Testament, which is Cognac Greek for that matter, don't try to go to a non sequitur. Quran is in Arabic language primarily and Arabic only. No matter which translation you bring to, when we are talking and we are debating, we are indulging in apologetics, we have to always go back to the original language. It is the same with Old Testament. Right, Sheikh? Yeah, absolutely. Think, absolutely yeah. yeah, okay. So that was the first thing. The second thing is when you are indulging in a linguistic analysis, and some of my family members came back to me after I gave them this book and they say, Oh my God, we can't understand even a word from it. When you are indulging into a linguistic analysis, please be patient with it. It's not a novel, you're not reading Mo Heather. You're not watching a Netflix Netflix series, right? You're not there to be entertained. You're in you're indulging into hermeneutics. You're indulging into semiotic study, hermeneutics, uh, the critical analysis of the text. You're indulging into linguistic analysis, which is a technical subject. So you'll have to sit down and study it like you studied your Mutalia Pakistan. Right, you you can't just pick up pick it up like Imran series and you know start reading it. Oh, somebody did this and somebody did that, and then there was a blast, and you know the protagonist, you know he rescued the heroine, and then they lived happily ever after. Just sit down with it, and first do a wudu because it is very important that you are spiritually 
willing to denote to it, to, to your energies. And there is a positive energy and a negative energy. Sheikh can tell you better about this. You know, he's much more learned than I am. But Quran and Hadith, they don't enter inside you, inside your brain or your heart, unless you have a wudu, unless you are ghairu junabi. I mean, I've had students come to me and ask me, sir, can we read the Quran when we are junabi, when we, we've had uh, ejaculation? And no, you can't. You need to understand the basic concept of tahara. So please sit down with it. It is the Quranic study of language. It is a technical subject. And then you would be able to understand this. Right, And you're trying to get to a point of like an aha moment or a eureka moment, right? A moment of like, like that raises your level of consciousness. Yes. And so that is, especially <coughs> with the idea of the miracle of Quran, it's really important that every Muslim try to uh, at least attempt to sit down uh, with the linguistic aspect of Quran and try to experience that miracle that will then lay, raise their level of insight, yeah. right? And Iman. And and then therefore the Iman, right? Absolutely. So, yeah. Sure. Okay. So, Yes, Bismillah. So even if you guys don't know Arabic, and I suspect that mo most of the viewers normally uh, don't really uh, know Arabic, that's all right. What I'm going to try and show you is some concrete, scientifically provable, empirical data that you can put your finger on from the Quran. So let's take it from the horse's mouth. Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. This is how Dr. Ahmad Bassam Asai begins his book, The Talkhis, and says, One day my friend asked me, and remember, he, he has all, also been a professor at Oxford. So this is his oriental friend, orientalist friend that is asking him, which is correct in Arabic, Mazala or Lazala? These are uh, both Arabic words. Without giving it much thought, I replied, Ma Zala. After some discussion, however, he insisted that La Zala was correct, while I insisted on Ma Zala. In the end, he surprised me by saying, well, then either you're mistaken or God is, after all, the Quran only uses La Zala. For a moment, I was speechless. Then I gathered my wits and asked him in turn, so how would you translate the verb Kana into English was, he replied without hesitation. If that's the case, I continued, then how would you translate the following phrase from the Quran? وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا And he translated, and God is oft forgiving, most merciful. He replied as confidently as before. Where is the verb kana in this translation? I wanted to know, but he couldn't answer me. And this is how the Tur Ahmad Bassam Asai begins his book. Allah says in the Quran, وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا Now, Shaykh, you know Arabic, Alhamdulillah. Kana is mad. Yakunu is mudari'ah. So, kana in Arabic means was. It's the past tense. And yakunu means is and will be. Right, Shaykh? But when the Quran says, وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا Does it mean and Allah was merciful and beneficent? Can we translate it like that? Can even an Orientalist translate it like this? No. No. So tell me just for a moment, just, just for a minute. I mean, let's zoom out. Let's zoom out and look at it just for a minute. Khan Allahu Ghafura Rahima. Is this human usage of the word Kana? No. Forget about even the whole book. Even if you understand this one point, this one point you will understand the miracle of the Qur'an. Using the word وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا in the meanings of Allah is the most merciful, the most beneficent. SubhanAllah. Show us, bring us something like it. Show us one work of human being. And this is an open challenge by Dr. Ahmad Bassam Asai, who's, who's a PhD, who's a PhD and has postdoctoral diplomas from Cambridge and Oxford. It's not my challenge. It's his challenge. You think the guy wouldn't have done his homework? Yeah. 
bring us one one even a single book in which a human author has used the word kana in the meaning of is Hello, the meaning, Sheikh. The meaning I mean, of was as is right which is very clear in the state what can allah ghafur rahim one thing is that and allah was merciful meaning because of a certain event for example meaning he is still merciful as he was in that event meaning it's even if you take it literally that's what i'm trying to say it would still be translated as is but yes. when you're translating and not only that it also adds like a type of emphasis right yes well, the, look... the eloquence yes the eloquence the way it is formed sheikh you have lived your life you lived your childhood in 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 uh, in arab country you lived your life in azhar tell me sheikh wallahi billah have you ever heard any of your shaykh asatiza anyone from amnia or speaking in lugha fusha using kana as is no it would be very strange and very <laughs> it would be for human beings it would be stupid i mean you and would the point thing out is that it fits the majesty of allah absolutely that's absolutely. a big part it's it's like the one who is saying it it's uh it's it's only possible from allah to be saying it that way meaning meaning from from the one who's claiming to be god it's only befitting to the uh place to the higher pedestal of the creator yeah who has created the language itself now that's that's why he which, can use it the which, way he likes which is why human beings can't say it because it would yes. make not sense you know absolutely because no one's going to take anyone else as god so only when god says it it sounds and that's one of the things i think about quran i did once an analysis of pronouns in quran based upon linguistic studies and stuff and it's it's true because uh only allah talks as allah meaning in the whole of sacred literature almost you know there are some parts of the bible that are kind of impressive but really the quran is it's like it's allah is talking clearly you know so anyway please continue absolutely sheikh bible is a work of art it is impressive like shakespeare is impressive i mean you read shakespeare and this is uh, also a point of comparison between dr ahmed bassam asai and the mutaqaddimin mufassirin for example if you read allama alusi in ruhul maani he often alludes to the miraculous nature of quranic language but he is most of the time talking about the literary aspects Well, you could find that in Shakespeare. Get thee to a nunnery. Why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? I wrote a forty pages paper on this alone, showing this uh, literary miracle of Shakespearean language. Mm. I mean, that's not a big deal. But the Quran is not a literary work. That's the point. Bible has passages which are at really high register of uh, literary English language, but the Quran. is not a work of literature it's not just some literary mahasin some some shaari mahasin some attributes of poetic language that you could find and search for in the quranic language it is the language itself the tarkeeb and i'll come to this in a minute it is the tarkeeb of the language the way it is framed it's not a new language it's still arabic language but the way it is framed the tarkeeb that are used the combinations that are used those are at a level which is not which cannot be matched by human beings it just cannot be and so sheikh uh, with your ijaza dr ahmed bassam asai continues and he uh, goes on to show how allah uses ma zala and la yazalu in the quran and that's very technical so i'll skip to the next point um for but for example just just a quick point wala yazaluna yuqatilunakum hatta yurid yaruddukum an dinikum your enemies will not cease to fight against you till they have turned you away from the faith if they can now basically la yazaluna is not used in human language uh, this way 
for and Dr. Ahmed Bassam Asai himself tells us about this and says, as for the Quranic use of the present tense phrase, la yazalu, it includes the past, the present, <laughs> and, and the future. Whatever action is being referred to was done in the past, is still being done in the present, and will continue to be done in the future. This semantic phenomenon is, uh, is observable in the Quran and Quran alone. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, the whole idea of mudari, I think, is yeah. so miraculous in itself, meaning the present future, right? So when you say something in the present, it also means the future. And so uh, it it encompasses, uh, no one can say, well, it's not talking about today. That was talking about that time. But the Quran is like present continuous, continuous. In, in, in a lot of its statements. And uh, anyway, so yes. Yes, Sheikh in Amiya, we say, La yazalu al harran. When we say, La yazalu al harran, it means, Ya Rabbi, uh, it, it's still, it is warm. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't mean it was warm in the past. It is still warm in the present. And it will be, you know, it will continue to be warm in the future. Who uses La yazal this way? Yeah. I mean, Kif, Kif, Ya Sheikh. Yeah. You can't. You can't use la yazalu in this way. Yeah. Fine, the, the, the idea of mudare is there, but when you say la yazalu, it, it fixes its meanings into imminent past. Mm. Like it was a, a warm just a couple of minutes ago and it's still warm. For example, if, if you uh, allow me to come to your place, sit down with you and you turn on air conditioning and it, it was very hot, let's say in New York, for example, but after 10 minutes of air conditioning, it's still warm. I'd say, Ya Sheikh, La Yazal al Jawharan. But can it mean if I use it, if I say La Yazalu, can it mean it was hot since the beginning of, of the universe? It is still hot and it will remain so till the end of days. Hmm. Yeah, of course. This, yeah. this meaning is uh, the divine lexicon and the divine vocabulary alone. It mm. is divine and divine alone. Only Allah can use it and uses it this way. No human being ever does. Mm. And so this is the aspect that ties into the in um, the um, the forfeiting aspect. Like everything is forfeited nowadays. You have a copy of everything. You can you can make a copy of everything. But this is the challenge that the Quran gives the non-believers, and this is what. Then Dr. Ahmad Bassam Asai talks about and says, someone might ask, is there anything in the world that can't be counterfeited anymore? People have managed to counterfeit the US dollar, the British sterling pound, the euro, the most and most, and if not all, of the world's other currencies as well. They have produced imitations of statues, literary works, ancient columns and coins and paintings of the greatest and best known artists in the world. So why couldn't someone write one or two surahs or verses like those in the Quran? Mm. This is the main question. Mm. And this is the question he's answering, like showing us the usage of certain words that cannot be used by human beings the way these are used by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not and in our it, psychology too. But because not in a, man inter, like intrinsically believes in God. So when God speaks as God in that way, it still makes sense. Even though no human being would talk like that. No one. Right? If it wasn't intrinsically part of human nature to believe in God, then the Quran wouldn't have made sense. Very meaning from a psychological perspective, when I'm looking at this, the Quran would not make sense to some if, if it was not human nature to believe in God. Then Quran, because of the approach of Quran, it's like I'm talking to mankind, right? From that like higher level. Yes. And you can't fake that uh, even if you try uh, unless it's genuine like in terms of the Quran and it can only be true in terms of communicating to man if man has some intrinsic sense of there is the divine 
So anyway, that's something to consider. Sheikh, what you're saying is actually extremely important. Jacques Lacan, he proposed the theory that subconscious is structured like a language and subconscious is based on the language itself. And so all of this ties into the idea of signifier and signified and then goes into the complexity of it. But what you're saying is actually very important that basically how is our psyche formed? It's through learning language. That is one of the theories of psychoanalysis, right? Sheikh, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. I mean, yeah. Well, I Adam, and we taught Adam, mm -hmm. man, as soon as he sees something, what does he do? He names it. We think in words. A dog thinks in smells, Right. So we think in words and in that prototype language or meta language that we have in our in our yes. fitra, in our in our um, in our nature, in our disposition, it includes the uh, hierarchy of language in a sense, which also then includes uh, the God for Allah talking to man which would be very different because of the yes. positioning. Meaning Allah would only talk to human beings in a certain way, right? And that's what kind of like affirms that Allah is talking as Allah in Quran on the one side and my inner self understands what he's saying. And even though I would not use that type of language. So, yes. anyway. In fact, I am not capable of using that type of language. This yeah. is the newness that Ahmad Basam Asai talks about. And people get confused. People like, you know who, get confused and think, you know, this is a new kind of language. Basically, Sheikh, when your and my psyche has been formed in a certain way, now if somebody comes and uses the same language in a totally different manner that we can't use, that would be a miracle, right? Mm -hmm. This is the miracle that the Qutur Ahmad Basama Sai is talking about. The long of Ferdinand de Sashore or the dissemination of, of the network of uh, meanings of Jacques Derrida. Those have been set. Those psyches have been formed. And here Allah sends the final message using the same long using the same human language, but framed in such a different manner that our subconscious and unconscious understands that this cannot be human. We cannot use it this way. I mean, Ya Shaykh, Surat Mudassir, Allah says, Qum fa anzir. Now in all your life, have you ever heard a human uh, being say, Qum fa anzir? No. Yeah. It's always, Qum ya walad. Yeah. Right? That's yeah, how you say it. Who says kum fa'anzir? That's right. For, for people who don't understand Arabic, you won't be able to appreciate the nuances. But the point is the way Allah says kum fa'anzir. This expression is not human expression. Our psyches, our subconscious, just, our... For the listeners, rise and warn. R rise and warn, yes. Rise and warn. And uh, yeah, absolutely. And so uh, no human would be able to think of saying something like that, right? Um, okay. Sheikh, on top of that, the most miraculous thing about this is even after the Quran, nobody could, nobody uses the language this way. Hmm. Nobody says, Qum Fanzir. nobody says, Wakan Allah, nobody says, Wakan Omar. I mean, you, Wakan, Omar, Ghafura. Can anyone say that? Is, is that even a human expression? Hmm. For example, I mean, I'm quoting, the Quran is with us now, right? So we know cognitively, rationally, that this is the way it can be formed, right? But can we form it this way? No. Do we form it this way? We don't. I mean, somebody could have turned around and said, okay, once it is revealed, it's human. It is a part of human consciousness. It is a part of collective human consciousness. But Allah says this very thing. Okay, you have rationally understood this. You know this is. these are the expressions. These are the new expressions that I have given you. Go on. Try and use these expressions. Go on. 
nobody nobody has ever i mean the two shauki wife you read his work is it's it's in one of the highest most registers of literary language right yes sir he is yeah. one of the foremost literary yeah. critic in the world arabic world mm. and dr ahmed bassam sai in this very book he shows that this is shauki zaif's uh, sentences and these are quran's sentences now can you even relate these two yeah yeah there is no comparison. so you, there is no comparison no this comparison. is the, this is the main miracle ya sheikh you have this book in your hand today you can read it you can cognitively understand those expressions you can rationally understand those expressions but can you use those expressions in your words can you use these expressions in your everyday talk no you can't i mean try it really abhi you uh, i i know you are all for the scientific method you know trying it yourself this could be a very good exercise yes because i did i i did that i tried doing so i tried talking the way allah speaks right 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 fatu bi surat mithl it's not possible yes yeah, it's not possible it's i mean alhamdulillah i astati an atakallam bil lughah al fusha al arabiyah i can speak in fusha arabic alhamdulillah but i can't even touch these expressions yeah can't even touch them yeah can't even touch them this is so eloquent this is the miraculous nature of the quran try if some of you are born uh, arabic in, in the arabic speaking world some of you are arabi please try and do this at home just just as an exercise try to speak this with your father with your mother with your siblings with your wife say for a day i want to talk in the expression of the quran <laughs> inna atayna <laughs> kal <laughs> right sheikh yes yes you're right it's impossible it's impossible man it is impossible i mean subhanallah this this credit goes to sheikh adaktur ahmed bassam asai I mean, Subhanallah. At least for me, I was blind to this aspect, to this side What of the miracle. What's interesting is that if I told somebody, "Here's a book," and signify everything important in it in some way, so somebody can underline something, circle something, right? Um, maybe highlight something, right? So there's different ways to show this is important. This is important. One of the amazing things I find about Quran is like everything is highlighted. but if you were to highlight it and then circle it and then uh, underline it for everything that you want to emphasize in a book it start looking ugly right but in the quran you have qasam you have lam taqid you have nun taqid you have you have repetition of the same ayah okay you have in tajweed wal dalin like for example emphasizing by that way you have emphasizing by uh, the 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 way the expression is right uh, you have it's you can emphasize something in maybe 30 40 different ways throughout the quran like almost everything is emphasized okay yes. right everything is emphasized in quran yet how can you write a book where everything is emphasized there's fir al amr right and so on and so forth and uh, so, so everything is emphasized it's like impossible like if somebody was to even try to express something like quran they would have to talk as if they're trying that uh, talk as i mean this one of the dimensions right out of many many but they would have to talk mostly in a way that they're being very emphatic the way quran is either by qasam or lam taqid or whatever other ways right or using inna and and its uh, sisters um how can you say every sentence by emphasizing it right it's like almost it's almost impossible for a human being to do that but allah does that literally everything is emphasized uh, throughout the whole quran yes. and so uh, anyway that was just something that came to my mind and then uh, i don't know if this makes sense or not but going back to my former comment where i was talking about only allah can talk in that way and a human being would understand so for even something as simple as uh, uh laysa ka mithlihi shay wa huwa as-sami'u al-basir right he sees and he hears so man understands oh he hears and he's 
we understand that when Allah is saying it, its its meaning is not like our meaning of listening, and uh, it's not in the same sense as I hear and I listen, but it is at, in absolute sense, right? And so there, this kind of like communication between God and man is almost embedded that man understands that when Allah is saying this, he means it in the infinite or the absolute sense. So anyway, that's just a side point. Please continue. Uh, no, very true, Sheikh. And I don't want to lose the people who are listening to this and get very technical. And I've been trying to, you know, uh, communicate in frank terms with you guys. So... Uh, the book is really technical, and uh, I'll just touch upon one or two more points so it doesn't burden your psyches and your intellect. Uh, Dr. Ahmad Bassam Asai on page 20 says, The Quran most certainly did not bring a new language separate from Arabic language that was already in existence. And it is in precisely this in which its miraculousness consists. The Quran was revealed in the Arabic language, Quran and Arabian. And remained rooted in its foundations. However, its uniqueness inheres in the way in which it went beyond the existing Arabic language, surpassing the limitations of its terms, structures, idioms, formulations, images, and internal relationships. The miraculousness of the Quran consists in the way in which it developed the Arabic language's conventions and rules, yet without a them, thereby opening the way for it to evolve and grow richer and endowing it with dimensions and horizons, the breadth of which its speakers had never dreamed of. The miraculousness of the Quran does not consist in its having created a language out of nothing. If it had done this, it would have separated itself and its teachings from all human beings, whatever their language. Rather, its miraculousness consists in its having constructed a new language on the very foundations of the old language. Mm -hmm. Then, gone soaring through vast realms that the traditional language had never known or accessed. And so Dr. Ahmad Bassam Asai makes this very clear that it is basically the, the surpassing of the limitations of its terms, structures, idioms, formulations, images, and internal relationships. These are the main six things that it surpasses of human language, found in, in the human language. Also, Sheikh, you know this better. The Quran is what started the Nahv part. That's right. Right? Um, there was this guy, I'm forgetting his name, who, who came to Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu karam Allah wajhul kareem and said somebody is reading, reciting an ayah of the Quran uh, in, 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 uh, in a mistaken fashion. And Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu, he wrote down some uh, sentences on something and gave it to him and said, In who has a Nahav? That is how Nahav started. That is how it, it conceived its name. So the grammarians, the, the schools of grammarians, it formed basically, they, these formed basically after the language of the Quran. Before the Quran, the surf was there. The etymological and morphological study of language was there. But the grammatical study really began with the Quran. Mm -hmm. And this is what Dr. Ahmad Bassam Asai hints. And then he goes on and there are a lot of things in here. And really, if, if I were to go into these things right here, it would become very complex for you guys. But let me just quickly show you uh, one other thing. Mm. Yes. It should be stressed here that the Holy Quran is the only book in the world which to this day has continued to be marked by features that it shares with no other book on earth. Now, this is extremely important and this is what we were talking about a minute ago, Ya Sheikh. That the book is in your hands, right? The book is in your hands. And it has been in your hands for what? 1400 years now? Hmm. and you haven't been able to use this language the way it has been used in this book hmm. I mean subhanallah yeah. if 
if it were something abstract, if I were sitting here and just telling you, oh, Allah speaks like this, or Allah will speak like this in Jannah, or he will say this, and you will say, okay, when it comes, it comes, we'll look into it. Mm -hmm. I can't imitate it right now because I don't have it in my head. But you have the Quran in your hand. It is a concrete thing. You have it in your hand and still it is as new as the day it was revealed to the Prophet. I mean, I sometimes feel that it, it's as if the Quran was revealed for this age and time. There's absolutely no doubt. Meaning, no, it's just it's just absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Meaning, I, I just don't have words to uh, it's you know, and in, in terms of its construction, right, it doesn't even use the human paradigm. Like, it doesn't use sentences, right? So you can say, Alif, Lam, Mim, it's an ayah. It's an right? ayah, yes. And then, uh, then you can have a long ayah that's consisted of many sentences. Like Ayatul Kursi. It's like Ayat almost 10 sentences. So And subhanAllah, it, you can have two word ayat in, in a surah like Surah Al-Mudathir or Al-Muzammil. Yeah. In comparison, yes, yeah, just just yes, 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 absolutely. And then you have its own; it has its own art form of how it is recited. Yes, right. Its own music, its own. Tone, and then, its and then the multiformicity of its skeletal words, the way they yeah. these can be pronounced in different lahjats, in different, uh, also different verb forms and whatnot. The qiraat aspect. I mean, subhanallah. And subhanallah. then the other interesting thing is that. You know, people that do poems, they learn to read. It's an, it's a, there's a, there's a science to how you read the poems, right? You have to emphasize certain words like Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, right? You, 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 over here, you have good kira, bad kira. Everyone can read Fatiha, right? And it's still, it is still has a certain level of melody, regardless of if you know how to read it properly or not. Um, and then another thing that Quran has very interesting is that if you're reading it from memory and you make a mistake, it'll stop you. Generally, either you'll go to another part of Quran that you know, or yeah, it'll stop yeah. you. You'll be stopped yes. in your tracks. There's no other book that can do that. I mean, you're literally reading. And sometimes you're reading a part, part of the Quran you've been reading all your life. But for some reason, today, I'm reading Surah Al-Isra, and I'm on a certain ayah, and I just forgot now when i forgot i'm going to go to another part of quran so there's no other book in terms of just every aspect everything from memorization to the way it is written to the way just all of that but one other thing that i wanted to share with you is that when we were talking about expressions and how it used the old arabic to create new expressions or new idioms like let's take the word soul soul means mm -hmm. fasting yes. so in the Arab world, Saum was used to train the horses for war. They would face the horses towards the harsh winds so they get used to it. That was called Saum. And that exercise that they used to give to the horses to train them for war was what the Quran then adopted for fasting. So anyway, Imsak, right? Imsak. So this holding yourself back, but in this particular way. So the Quran also uh, took the words that they were using and then gave it a, uh, a spiritual dimension to it in terms of human beings. The same thing is for salat, right? Which can generally mean dua, but then it was given a certain shape and a certain form. And it was made... And what's very interesting is that Quran uh, has this interesting combination between using a certain word technically and using a certain word linguistically. Yes. And one of the mistakes people who, who dive into Quran without understanding Quran is that they take everything that is in Quran technically and make it linguistic. Or vice versa. Or vice versa. Like Qibla. Qibla means direction. Even though it has a technical meaning of a specific direction. Right? And the Jews had a specific direction. Muslims were given a specific direction. So anyway, uh, maybe I'm going off uh, charts here. 
uh, please continue. No, no, Sheikh. Uh, absolutely not. Very important things that you are uh, saying. Um, so I'll uh, I'm going to end my presentation pretty much in in one or two more points. And one of the points that I want to make here and highlight here is the fact is that the corpus of genuine prophetic hadith has been infiltrated by thousands of forgeries. There is a very important chapter in uh, the Qutur Ahmad Basama Sa'i's this book, which is a comparison of Quranic language and the prophetic language. We all know that the canon of hadith has been infiltrated by counterfeit hadith. Mawdu'at, Munkarat, Du'afa. We have the books Du'afa Sagir, Du'afa Al Kabir. We have this great work by Sheikh Al Bani, Sisla Hadith Al Da'ifa Wal Mawdu'ah, and Sisla Hadith Sahiha. Dr. Ahmad Bassam Asai makes a very important point. He says this is the miracle of the Quranic language that the Hadith is forced. Wait a minute, what? Yes, let me reiterate. Part of the miracle of the Quran is that the language of the Prophet has to be imitable. If it weren't, because it's coming from the same source, somebody could have turned around and said, what is your dalil, what is your proof that this is the word of Allah, this is the word of the Prophet. This is an important point that Sheikh Ahmed Basama Sai makes. He says, look at the forgeries in the Hadith canon this way. If these weren't there, if the language of the Prophet wasallam was as high as the Qur'ans and could not have been forfeited, what would have been our dalil as Muslims that this is coming from Allah and this is coming from the Prophet? Hmm. Now we can make a clear distinction <coughs> that this is the language of a human being, which is our Rasul, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and this is the language of the Quran, which cannot be imitated. Hmm. This is a very important point that he makes in his book, and it's interesting to indulge into. Um, yeah, no, so, this yeah. is a very, very interesting point and a very important point. Because, uh, first of all, the Prophet said about himself, and afsahul aram. I'm the most eloquent of Arabic speakers. But there is a clear difference between the Prophet talking, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the Quran speaking. There's a clear difference. And uh, again, people that maybe mind us talking about tradition, but I'll mention it anyway, is that there were many tabarin that who would be listening and they would be able to tell this is a saying of the Prophet or this is from the Quran because of the different types of nur that came out from the Quran and the different type of nur that came out from the sayings of the Prophet. But the point I'm trying to make here is that if we said the Quran is from Prophet Muhammad and there was no record of his own words, right? Then it would be even questionable, is this really from Muhammad? But because we say this is from Muhammad and this is also from Muhammad, and sometimes he's actually explaining the Quran in that. So, so there is, you could say, a um, a strong link. And one can see, okay, this is the word of God. And this is the word of the most eloquent speaker of Arabic language. And even that is a yardstick within Hadith literature. Meaning if something is not very eloquent, then we also know then that that's not the Prophet saying that. But we certainly know if something is not eloquent then that's questionable even within hadith literature meaning but this point that you just mentioned that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to allow the prophet's voice being recorded to be able to compare muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a prophet versus the quran the word of allah which is eternal and i think that's a very important subject uh and in fact in azhar there was a small class on this specific subject which was the eloquence of quran in comparison to eloquence and the balagha of the sayings of the prophet even though his eloquence was you know or you know these kind of like what we find the prophet 
his language, his style, repeating over and over again, right, uh, can be very easily distinguishable and different from the way the Quran is. And so I think there's there's a lot more to what you just said about this in terms of the wisdom of why Allah allowed this. Uh, there's a lot more wisdom to it than even meets the eye. Uh, I guess that's Absolutely. one way to put it. Absolutely, sure. And so really, uh, I, I would like to end my presentation pretty much here. Just one more point in continuation to this very point, Yashe, that you're making. Uh, and and for the rest of it, there is now a lengthy technical discussion on iltifat, on imagery, istiarat, the uh, the terms like istiara, tasrihiya, makaniya, the the ilmul bal in ilmul balaga, it really came into existence after the Quran. Mm -hmm. When when Allah says in Surah Yasin, for example, yom yajalul wildan shiva, mm -hmm. that day will turn the children into old, old men. men. Mm -hmm. Is this really something that a human being can frame into expression? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, who says <laughs> and then the 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 yom malik malik maliki yom din mm -hmm. sheikh we can own a pen right we can own a laptop we can own a cell phone this this uh, idea of owning the time owning a yom is really a divine expression Mm -hmm. Human human beings don't say this. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard somebody in whatever language? I mean, let's not even talk about Arabic, but have you ever heard somebody say, Oh, I'm I am the owner of Tuesday? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, ca can this happen? Yeah. This, this is impossible, yeah, Sheikh. This, this cannot. This is not human expression. Yeah. I mean, who says, "Yar, acha, give me your uh, new uh, Apple phone. I'll give you Monday." <laughs> I mean, I mean, yeah. brother, you don't own Monday. I mean, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, it's, right. It's only Allah could use those expressions, right? Uniquely, oh, oh. meaning uniquely, yeah. human beings would sure. not. And um, on the same point. Right. If you take, for example, the names of Allah, I remember Shaykh Ahmed Dath once said to a Christian in one of the debates or something. He said, "Okay, uh, Allah in Islam has ninety-nine names, right? And most of them are in the Quran. Some are not, and some others are in Quran that are not in the Hadith. But let's say Allah has a hundred names in Quran, easily. Actually, tell me how can a, a human being think of a hundred names of Allah?" Uh, there is another story uh, about uh, there was uh, two gentlemen in Saudi Arabia discussing Islam. And uh, one of the gentlemen was not Muslim and he was discussing with another gentleman who was Muslim, a scholar. And uh, he said, uh, you know, I don't believe in the or I don't believe in Islam. And so he the scholar challenged him. He said, give me your best description of the hellfire that you can and try to see if it matches with the description of the hellfire. Meaning, you want to create a place of punishment, right? <laughs> In your mind. Give it your best try. Try to describe the hellfire better than the Quran does. Right? So he won't tried. Be able to. He can't. Try to compete against the description of Quran for paradise or any anything like this. I mean, any or, word. Or the way Qiyamah. Or the way Qiyamah is or the described day of judgment in the Quran. Is, yes, exactly. I mean, there's. It's just not possible, right? Uh, and again, that has to do with uh, truthfulness and the type of details you are able to give because something is truthful, right? So uh, that it's just not possible unless you are. Meaning unless you are Allah, you can only describe yourself in a way that human beings generally will think of seven, eight names, you know, he's omniscient, omnipotent. All except... right, maybe a dozen. Yeah, but not a hundred, right? Yeah, and how? Uh, how can... So this is, uh, subhanAllah, a very... Uh, so this is the thing, is that uh, why, number one, every Muslim should try to learn Arabic. At least that basic amount of Arabic that can give you this 
because I, I'd say these two, if these two things come together, it makes a very, actually three things I'll say, very powerful iman. If you get some sense of the divine the literary aspect of Quran, the, the mords of Quran that the Sahaba experienced. With that, if you get some sense of how Quran is talking to the world today, both in terms of its signs, meaning science, and how it's relative to the world in general, to the world of today, and then some historical sense of how Quran sees history. But we can leave the third historical part out for now. But if you have this like layering of where you're like convinced, okay, and and this is the problem. Most Muslims are only Muslims because they were born Muslims, right? And what we need is Muslims to be consciously Muslim. And to be consciously Muslim, the miracle of the Prophet is the Quran. And so every Muslim must indulge and dive and try to absorb the Quran, to experience the Quran, to be able to appreciate, wait, this is really true. But I want to end with showing everyone something but very true. Sheikh, be yes, before absolutely, that, absolutely. just just yes, just just allow me to uh end my presentation on this note, continuing from the last point, that one uh, last thing that Dr. Ahmad Basam Asai does in his book dexterously is that he annihilates the the points that the mustashriqeen the orientalists raise against some so called mistakes in the quran mm. and he ridicule ridicules them he mm. says if you don't have degrees in literature that's you know that's really your problem if you can't understand for example sheikh iltifat i can't explain this mm. in 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 a short that time but good. you know what yes, yes. yes what you're talking so most of the mustashriqeen there is negative points about iltifat in the Quran. And so he shows clearly how this is actually a miracle of the language. <laughs> For example, in hadhan ila sahira, inna hadhan ila sahiran, or inna hadhain ila sahiran. You know, the kind of, um, let's say, let's put it this way, the kind of nonsense that people like Abdul Fadi comes up with, right? Saying that these are mistakes in the Quran. He shows this completely and uh, annihilates it. And so this becomes very technical, extremely technical. So you guys, uh, for, for the rest of the points, you guys should uh, watch my, I, I'm not trying to market my videos or anything, but really trying to explain this here would be a burden on your intellect and a burden on your psyche. So I would like to end, end it with this, my presentation, my side of the presentation with, with saying this, this is a book that every Muslim should at least read once before he or she dies. Hmm. I mean, wallahi, uqsimu billahi laweem, in the modern times, I haven't come across any other book as important as this one. Hmm. As Sheikh Umar Baloch himself said, that this is the primary thing to learn about the mojiz of the Quran in today's time and world and experience it the way the Sahaba experienced it from Famin Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This should be a human... <coughs> A, a Muslim's main task in these times. And so please, please, I beseech every Muslim to at least read this book before he or she dies at least once. Just try and go through this. Inshallah, it will increase your iman. We, me or Sheikh Umar Baloch are not affiliated with this. We won't make any money if you download this book from Amazon or buy it. We have no personal gain attached to this. As Muslimin, yaar, wallahi, as Muslimin, we are asking you to please at least give this book a read so you could understand what the miracle of the Quran is in concrete terms. And uh, let me just uh, end by uh, showing this is your... Um channel your youtube channel myc podcast and in there you have a section of 13 lectures on miraculous language of the quran and yes so, Sheikh, it is still not finished inshallah within a week or so i will finish this inshallah okay and so people are welcome to go to your web your channel and they're welcome to listen to this on a uh you know whatever uh, whatever pace that is suitable to them but on Iltifat, I'll mention this, 
and then we'll end inshallah after your final words is that it's like a movie right when the camera is in third person yeah. and then the camera goes into second person or first person like it zooms in and the iltifat of the quran or the it's like the same ayah is continuing in third person goes to first person goes back to third person, third person like this right and it's like it's like a movie that is like zooming in and then zooming out right and it's also about like your uh when allah wants to em again emphasize something allah may say it in the first person yes subhanallah asra bi abdihi laylam subhanallah starts with first person singular and then allah barak na hawlahu yeah Yes. Then changes to third person in the next ayah, then comes back to first person. I mean, so subhanAllah. Iltifat is one of those, like, how do you talk in a way that you're changing from third person to second person to first person? And all, I, this is just impossible. The I think iltifat is, from even the time of the Sahaba, they must have been like, wow. <laughs> like, because no <laughs> one can do this. No one can do this. No one can go from, you know, anyway. So, yes, please, last words. Jazakallah uh, wa al-jazaya, Shaykh. Inshallah, uh, by your help, through your channel, inshallah, hopefully many Muslims will get this message that they should at least read this book once in their lifetime. Inshallah, bi ta'ala, the way you've, you've put it, that this will increase their iman and anchor them to the most central pillar of our belief, which is the Qur'an. Hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Jazakumullah khairan. Jazakumullah khairan.